so that we would understand uh, the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's, uh, let's go over the quiz on uh, study 10. Uh, what are the three elements of saving faith? Number one, knowledge. knowledge. Two, assent. 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 And trust. 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 trust, right. It was the third element that the Reformation brought into the definition that clarified um, and, and, and uh, completed what was missing in the medieval definition. Knowledge and assent, that's the, that's, uh, the, devil, the devil's able to do that. What's missing is personal repentance, personal trust, uh, the, the soul clinging to Christ. Okay, what are the three elements of repentance? Agreement. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, confess, um, to, uh, to say the same thing, uh, to... Acknowledge what God says. So there's confession. Acknowledge grief. Yeah, grief. And what's the other? Turning. Yeah, the will. So there's the there's the the mind, the emotions, and the will. Uh, repent really is the the. the Comprehensive word. Amalegao. Uh, excuse me. It's like the turning. That's confess. Repent is uh, is uh, metanoia, which is a change, a change of mind. Noia is mind, change of mind. So confess is to lego, lego, legeo is to say homo is the same. Metanoia uh, is to is to meta the change of the noia, the thinking, the mind, the will, the turning of the person. All right, well, can what be saved without good works? Explain. No. No. Yes. Yeah. Well, so explain you, yes. You can say either one, but you have to explain that. Is, that is yes. that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to defend your answer. Yes, we are not saved by good works in any way. So without good works, we can be saved. Yeah. But. But, what is, the, Dan, what's the, uh, the other side of the story? I mean, the, the one-liner, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. Saving faith is always accompanied by good works. Right. Ephesians 2.10, James chapter 2. Right. So it's the root versus the fruit. It necessarily follows from. So good works are necessary, but they're never meritorious. They do not contribute. They flow from. Uh, okay. Um, is, is the statement, once saved, always saved, true? Yes. 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 But. Huh? But you it's very misleading. You want to qualify this one, too, do you? <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I qualify everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's misleading. It gives you the idea that you walk the walk, you pray the prayer, you've got your ticket punched, and you're good to go, which is not true. That's the wrong view of Sal. That's the wrong view Correct. of Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. But that statement tends to imply. But on its own, this is true. Correct. Yes. What, if, you are, if you have uh, exercise saving faith, that is a salvation that you possess and you cannot lose it. When you are justified, that's a declaration a fi with a finality, a verdict that has been rendered by God, and you are now in, that is the status you now have and you cannot lose. All right. Is that uh, verdict rendered before the foundation of the world? Excuse me? Is that verdict rendered before the foundation of the world? Um, no, it's rendered in time, not the moment you believe. All right, um, of these three, perseverance, preservation, and eternal security, which is to be preferred? preferred? Not eternal security. Perseverance. Preservation. preservation. Who, who, who wants perseverance? <coughs> yes. Jackson? Yeah, because to look at and see that we're preserved or that we're eternally secure kind of means on the same idea that once saved, always saved. It's just this has happened now. We don't have to we can just exist in our sin even if we saved. Yeah, so the original language that came out of Dort with the, uh, you know, the formulations against the five points of Arminianism was perseverance. 
it's a, from, you know, from the human side, you must persevere. But the divine side is God preserves. And so we are eternally secure. But all this takes some conversation. It takes some explanation to make sure that we're being understood what, by what we're saying. Because uh, the concern here, which was very, very prevalent in the circles that I grew up in, where it was pray the prayer, you know, walk the aisle, sign the card, and so forth, uh, we, we just had a super abundance of people who had done that and who had no resemblance to, you know, biblical Christianity, the Christian life, um, holiness. It, 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 it was fire insurance. And if you mentioned anything to them, you called the Eucharist. Well, that too. So lots of carnality among people who have no intention of obeying uh, God, serving Christ, uh, contributing to the life of the church. Uh, it's just uh, it's fire insurance. All right. So is it perseverance or preservation? It's not eternal security. Yes. Per perseverance, I think, is the preferred word uh, for our purposes. Uh, but these two are true. Because preservation puts it on shifts the onus to God doing the preserving work. But we are only able to persevere because he preserves, right? And, and we're only secure because he, he um, you know, he takes us into his hands and there's no one who can pluck us from those almighty double-wrapped hands. Uh, okay, list the first seven stages of the Ordo Salutis beginning with election. Election. Okay, what's another word for that? Regeneration. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Next. It's a little different in the notes. Yeah, let's say it's union with Christ. Union with Christ is number three in the notes. You know, the reason for this is I think, maybe I explained it in the notes, that uh, union with Christ can go anywhere on this line. Are you elect in Christ? Yeah, I'm afraid so. You know, are you born again by the Spirit of Christ? Uh, yeah, so I, I think union with Christ goes anywhere along the line. And uh, so, nevertheless, effectual call, regeneration, what follows of that? Yeah. Justification. Something's got to precede justification. Faith, faith, repentance. Okay. Conversion. Faith and repentance. Um, reason why it's here number four, because in the catechisms it talks about us being united to Christ by faith. But I think it goes every, anywhere. All right, what, what follows faith and repentance? Just, just, just Justification just, and? Can you move the paper up? Adoption. Oops. Adoption. Both of these are verdicts. Then what? Same process. Why has it only got seven lines? It only asked for seven. This first question is this was the first seven. Oh, okay. Eight? Four. Perseverance. Perseverance. And nine? To glorification. Four. Glorification. Okay. Shorter catechism. What does God require of us that we may escape? the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin. This is a great definition. I commend it to you. When I memorized the shorter catechism, I stopped on number 39. So I must go to the book now. But um, what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To, uh, to, re to escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ and, and repentance unto life with the diligent use of all the outward means. Okay. And um, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby God we receive and the rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Okay, and what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ dies with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God the full purpose of and never after new obedience. Okay. Uh, these are very handy definitions.
and I commend them to you, even if I don't myself know all of them. All right, so assurance. Um, let's, uh, let's begin to go through these. Um, study number 11. Who should be assured of their salvation and on what basis? On what basis? All those who truly believe in the Lord, sincerely love Him, work in the conscience of the Lord. Okay, that's all, that's all well and good, but what is the confession concerned about when you give that answer? When you say faith in Jesus Christ is the basis for our assurance, which is absolutely true, absolutely the case. That's how we know that we're forgiven. That's how we know we're reconciled to God. That's how we know we have the gift of eternal life. But there is a problem. And what is the problem? The very first line that so hypocrites and unconverted men deceive themselves. Yeah, the, 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 what, what the confession takes seriously is something that I'm afraid that we don't take seriously. Is that it takes, it takes with uh, utmost seriousness the problem of self-deception and presumption. Um, that arises out of cheap grace and easy believism. Um, so, so the concern at the outset is, and, 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 and by the way, the, the confession as always is navigating between Rome on the right that absolutely denies any assurance of salvation. Except to, you know, saints who do works of super irrigation where they know they're saved and they have a, you know, merits, they, they contribute to the treasury of merits that you can draw on in, in order to, um, you know, reduce your time in purgatory. Other than super saints, everybody else, for anyone else that would claim to have assurance, that's just presumption as far as they're concerned. You're anathematized by the Council of Trent. You can't know that you're saved. And you think you're so, you know, it's that, it's that kind of, you think you're so good, you think you're so righteous that you would go to heaven? No, you can't have assurance, not in this world. Terry, uh, how, how is that sainthood acquired or declared? Who says so? Was it the Pope or was it a... The cardinals or the bishop? Well, or ultimately, or? yeah, I think ultimately it's, a, it's the Pope's decision. So and it, it, it would, it would, yeah. ha, would it happen, it always happen after, the, after death, yeah, right? I think, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, even they wouldn't know. So you have no, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Even they wouldn't know in this life that, uh, that they, they, they had um, done, because remember now, justification is based on grace enabling you to do the good works by which you will be justified. So you can never know if you've done enough good works. So you can never know, you can never have assurance. You can never know whether you've made the grade. So, so uh, in the Roman system, the Roman is almost meaningless and you never have peace with God. You know, I had, I had I, know that. So that would be our argument, yes. You can't know that Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation. You can't know Romans 5, 1, that you have, have peace with God. So as Carl Truman points out in his book on creeds, one of the first benefits that somebody who converts from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism is that they can know that they are saved. They can have the assurance of their salvation, which on, on Roman Catholic terms, you can never know. Uh, so, so there's that side. That's the right side, as it were, of the problem. The left side of the problem is self-deception. Somebody thinks they're saved, they're not. Uh, th those envisioned by Jesus, uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? That, well, well, we'll read that verse in a minute. But did we not do this and that and prophesy in your name and so forth? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. So clearly they're self-deceived or presumptuous. So that, that, that's a real problem. And it is a prominently addressed problem in the New Testament. Just get your little concordance and go look up um, self-deception, self-deceived, self-deception. Uh, and it's, it's prominent, as, as we'll see in a minute. So here's what the confession actually says. Although hypocrites and other regenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions, there's the problem, of being in the favor of God and a state of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish, yet such as truly believe, there's the difference, such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. Uh, so you'll recall that we said, this is the first confessional document that has a separate chapter on uh, adoption 
so likewise, this is the only confessional document that has a separate chapter on assurance. That's how important this doctrine was seen by the, West, the Westminster divines, by the whole Protestant Puritan heritage. This is a, a crucial uh, you know, gift of God for the people of God that, um, that enables them to have peace and joy and assurance rather than fear and um, anxiety about eternity. All right, this certainty is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope. Isn't that a great sentence? It's not bare conjecture. It's a not a probable persuasion, and it's not based on some fallible hope, but, but an infallible assurance of faith founded upon the divine truth of the promises of salvation, the inward testimony of those graces unto which these promises are made, the testimony of the Holy Spirit of, of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God, which spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, whereby we are sealed uh, to the day of redemption. So in answer to the questions, here, here are some of the issues that the Bible deals with. Now, 1 John 5.13, I write things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. So, you know, there's one of our questions for Rome. What You can know. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. As the same is said, different wording at the end of John's Gospel. All right, uh, 1 John 2, 3, and 4, by this we know. And this is, this is a refrain in in 1st um, in first, first John, well, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John for that matter. How do, can, what can we know? And, and repeatedly, and, and then he gives the basis upon which we can know. By this we know that we are in him. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the fact of assurance, and, and then here's the problem of self-deception. I, here's somebody who says, I know him, but I don't keep his commandments? That's impossible. You, you cannot know God and not characteristically, not saying infallibly, but characteristically, habitually keep the commandments. If you, if you say you know him, you're, you're just lying. You don't have the truth in you. You're defiant, you're rebellious, you're disobedient. That's characteristic. That's uh, the, your manner of life. Can't be, can't be. We know, he says, that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. See, and once again, here's the assurance, but then here's this. You, you claim to you know, but you don't love. You don't, you're not characterized by love. Um, then you abide in death. Your claim is false. Your experience is false. You're self-deceived. You're presumptuous. So again, look at, look at the number of times. This, this is, we're cautioned about this. Anyone thinks he has something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Uh, James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Uh, I mean, there can be people who are connoisseurs of sermons. Oh, they love, you know, they love to come to church and they love to hear sermons. They evaluate the rhetorical skill and the, the orator's ability and so forth and so on. Uh, so you're just, you're just a hearer. If you're only a hearer and you're not a doer, you're not implementing, you're not obeying, you're not serving, you're... Uh, you're not uh, changing your outlook and, and, and being uh, altered and, and transformed by the ministry of the word, then you're just, you're just a listener and you're, de you're deceived. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but what? Deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Again, self-deception. First John 1, if we say we have no sin, we repeat this virtually every Sunday night, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then here's the Matthew 7 um, 22 to 24, to me this is, this is the most unsettling, uh, the most unsettling of all the, basically, of, uh, I don't know, of, of, every, of, of any text in the whole Bible. To me this is the most unsettling. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And we cast out demons in your name. We did mighty works in your name, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, anomia. Everyone who then hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his head upon the rock. So that is an issue. That is a problem. So in terms of the confession, 
we, we, we have here identified the promises, uh, the evidence of the graces, and the testimony of the Spirit. Uh, and so what, uh, what, what we see in the confession is a threefold basis for assurance. One, the promises of God. So that's where it certainly begins. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Are you a whosoever? Uh, do you believe in Jesus? Uh, is the, does the promise then apply to you? You're a whosoever. You believe the promise of God and the gospel. You believe in him. So, so what is guaranteed to you? You will not perish. That's the basis of salvation. Uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our do you have the free gift? Have you turned from your sin? Then, 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 then what do you now possess? Uh, you have the free gift of God, which is what? Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we, we claim the promises. We build assurance on the foundation of the promises of God to those who believe. Do I believe? If I do, uh, then I can know. I believe in Christ. I've repented of my sins. I've turned to him by faith. I have eternal life. I am saved. I cannot but be saved. I will not be lost. I am assured. I am, I am secure. All right, then secondly, the signs of grace. Uh, this is, let's say, let's say you, you totally believe what we're saying. You believe in justification by faith alone, and you know that it's only by faith that you could possibly be saved. The question is, which was always the question for me growing up, but do I really believe? Or have I just inherited this faith? Is it just something that I hold to because it's expected of me, because, because I go to church and I'm in a Christian family? Is my faith genuine or is it, um, is it, is it, is it, uh, is it fake? Is it, is, it, is it genuine or is it a counterfeit? So that's what I always struggled with. Do I really believe? So the confession is pointing to another line of evidence so number one, do you believe the promises? Number two, is there a sign of transformation? You, uh, you know, the Second Corinthians five seventeen, you become a new creature in Christ. Are you a new creature? Have the old things passed away? Have all things become new? Have you been born again? Uh, is there has there been the transformation internally in terms of heart attitudes, and has there been a transformation externally in terms of change change of conduct? You know, have you have you gotten rid of your idols? Are you uh, mortifying your lusts? So, uh, uh, so we have this, um, this progression uh, as an example of 1 Peter, 5, uh, uh, you know, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 11. Uh, so he, he, he's, he's describing the transformation that goes on for the believer, th you know, not without our effort, uh, but um, on the basis of the gospel and, 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 and spiritual rebirth and... Uh, which he goes on at the end of this chapter. He says, we're born again by the living and abiding word. He says, we grow by the pure milk of the word in the second chapter. But make every effort. Here's your part to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. These qualities are yours and are increasing. They are yours. This is what happens. You, you're transformed by Christ and his gospel. They keep you from being ineffectual or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For then whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, always, oh, you always want to ask, what's the therefore? Therefore, here's the conclusion. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Are you, you know, have you really been called by the gospel, to faith in Christ, are you among those chosen by God, elect by God? And, and here's the evidence for, if you practice these things, you will never fail. In other words, the practice of these things is evidence of the calling and election. For in this way, uh, in this way, there will be richly provided for you an inheritance uh, into the inheritance kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The same thing in 2 Corinthians uh, 13, uh, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, so, uh, you know, self-examination, self-testing. Uh, do, you, do you not realize this about yourselves that 
Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So where, where are the fruit of the Spirit? Uh, are you indwelt by the Holy Spirit? There should be the inward transformation of uh, the character of the, the individual. Where is the change in the external behavior? And then the three, and I'll take a question. Then finally, the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. So this is objective. You know, you have the promises of God. This is subjective and objective, the internal transformation that, that leads, or, 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 or rather the, yeah, the internal transformation that bears fruit in external behavior, the new, the new creature in Christ, and then the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. This is more mystical. You do not receive the spirit of slavery, slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I don't think this happens apart from these, but it's over and above these, a, 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 um, a confirming uh, of our salvation, that we are in a right relationship with God, that we have been adopted and are members of the family of God, that we are true believers and all the promises of God apply to us. Yes, question. Uh, the verse, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, at the very end, when it says, unless you indeed to unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Is he referring, do you feel, to something specific? Like, what does he have in mind when he says the test? Um, the te I think he's talking about the test of your faith. Is, is, is your faith genuine? So examine yourselves. Are you a real believer? Whether you are in the faith, or are you outside of the faith? Uh, have, is, your genuine, is your repentance genuine? Is your faith authentic? Or, or are they counterfeits? So you need to examine yourself. He's telling the Corinthians, and no doubt there's, that's been important for believers all through the centuries to not um, fall to self-deception through self, uh, faulty self-evaluation. Ben? Uh, I'm curious, what, what pastoral advice would you give to someone who's going through this test, like self-testing? Because I feel like when I, when I have experienced times in my life of doubt or questioning my, like the genuineness of my own faith. It's usually just been like internal moping that has lasted a long period of time. And eventually I'm like, oh, well, I probably am good. Uh, and probably would have been nice to have had someone like actually counsel me through that. And so curious what, like, what practical advice you'd give to someone who's looking to, to test their faith or examine themselves. Um, those, those three things would be a great place to start. What would that? The truth of the promises of God, the signs of grace, and then the testimony of the Holy Spirit, which is the elusive one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's no replacement for re rehearsing the promises of God in prayer and praying for assurance and praying for confidence, praying for certainty, uh, praying for the peace of God, praying for the joy of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, overcoming your doubts and your fears and your anxieties about this. I mean, it's something you want to get right. Yeah. And um, so the next paragraph and the next question too is, is I think realistic. So, so, you know, I was part of a, at least a loosely associated with a campus organization in which, you know, if you didn't have assurance, you know, there's just, it was just a mechanical process. I think we talked about this last time. You, you, know, you breathe out your sin and you breathe in the Holy Spirit. You're commanded to be filled. You are filled. And you just trust the promises of God. And it was just one, two, three, and it's all easy. And, you know, it's just not the way it works for human beings, especially particularly sensitive souls. So this, this is uh, the paragraph three recognizes this, and it argues this infallible assurance does not so belong to the essence of faith. So there are those who believe that Calvin... Um, identified faith and assurance and used them interchangeably. And this was a com common amongst the critics of the Puritans that Calvin, for Calvin, faith uh, and assurance um, uh, were one and the same thing. And so if you believed, you had assurance. Uh, and the Puritans came along and made that more complex so that you could have faith and then not have assurance. And so you have all these believers who were wringing their hands and trying to get there, as, as it were. That sounds like it confuses faith in Christ with faith in your faith, or conflates those two. Well, it could, could be that that's right. We don't have faith in faith, we have faith in Christ. 
Uh, so anyway, I did a paper on this when I was in England, and um, I decided my conclusion was they're just misreading Calvin. Calvin recognizes that you can have genuine faith and yet struggle to have assurance. Uh, you just have to read him more carefully and not hate the Puritans. <laughs> you come to the right conclusion on that. Um, so it's not of the essence of faith. In other words, you can have saving faith, but you're still just not sure about the authenticity of your own faith. You really are trusting Christ for your salvation. You have no, you're not trusting in your own righteousness, your own virtue, your own goodness. Um, you're not trusting in the church. You're not tr trusting in the clergy. You're not trusting in the family you were born into. You're not trusting in your baptism. You're trusting in Christ, but you still struggle with whether or not it's authentic or genuine or it's, super fit, it's, it's superficial and false and hypocritical and counterfeit and, and so forth. That a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation and the right use of ordinary means, you know, this is what the confession and the whole reformed tradition loves to urge you to do. Use the ordinary means, meaning what? Go to church. You know, go to church Sunday morning. Go to church Sunday night where you will be under the ministry of the word as it's being read and preached and sung and prayed and displayed in the sacraments. Go to church under the ordained ministry where Jesus promises to be by his spirit, where two or more are gathered in his name. Enjoy the presence of Christ, the fellowship of the saints, the ministry of the word, week in, week out, month after month, year after year. You're struggling to know whether or not you're saved? Well, get into church. Get in there and be there and be consistent and be regular. And that'll make a huge difference. And then ordinary means, at home, read the Bible, pray, seek it, seek assurance. So the right use of ordinary unions attain thereunto, and therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, there's the echo of the passage we just read, and that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of assurance. So far is it inclining men to looseness. So that's the accusation of Rome, and it's the accusation of Arminians. Who, who deny the possibility of assurance, who, who believe that you can lose your salvation. So I think we looked at that last time we were looking at the perseverance of the saints. Our men in theology believes that you can lose your salvation. So assurance is only ever a temporary thing. So John Wesley, for example, when his heart was strangely warmed in his Aldersgate experience, you look, read his diary a few days later, he's lost it again. And that's, a, that's just characteristic of the whole Wesleyan tradition. They cannot maintain it because you can you you can you can lose your salvation you you can fall away from the faith permanently and damnably um, uh, and one of the, the arguments of the arminian as well as the roman catholic position on this is that if you tell people once they're saved always saved then they'll lose all motivation for obedience which I think that if you're not genuinely converted, that's the case. If you're genuinely converted, you're not looking for an excuse to sin. You don't want to sin. You hate sin. You want to be holy. You want to, um, you want to embody the, um, you know, the, the virtues of Christ. You want to follow in his steps. You want to have the attitude that was in Christ Jesus, you know, Philippians 2, 4. You're, you're not looking for an excuse to sin. So I think that that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what motivates us. It's the love of God in Christ that motivates us. It's that we've been saved from our sin and rescued and that it's all by the grace of God and we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, and we didn't have it coming to us and yet we were saved and so out of gratitude and, and, and love, we want to obey him and serve him and please him. Uh, so this is a response to that and trying to say to both the Arminians on the left and the Roman Catholics on the right, it is not, in, does not incline the genuinely converted to looseness. Right? It's just the opposite. It motivates. It, uh, it, uh, um, uh, the, the heart being enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of, of assurance. That's the result is that uh, 
I, I want to o obey out of thankfulness and as strengthened and so forth. It doesn't incline to looseness. So the confession not only contradicts Trent in saying that we can't have assurance, it goes further than, than that in teaching that we should have assurance and we should seek assurance yes. if we do not. Have yes, it. it's saying you have a responsibility to seek it. Okay, question number two then is, is it possible for a genuine believer to doubt his salvation? Under what conditions does this happen? And what can be done about it? We want to read paragraph four as well. So true believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted as by negligence in preserving it by falling into some special sin which woundeth the conscience and grieveth the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light, for reference point, multiple psalms and the book of Job. God has his own purposes and sometimes this is what he does. So why do you hide himself? That's a, that's a common question. Why do you hide yourself? being asked in the Psalms, because the sense of his presence and blessing and favor seems to have been withdrawn uh, so that God's people will trust the naked promise and not their own experience. Um, so have no light, yet they are never utterly, never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience uh, of duty out of which by the operation of the spirit this assurance may in due time be revived and by which in the meantime they are supported from utter despair. So basically to summarize what that's saying, I, I see three things. Proximity to conversion, you know, the young convert may not have assurance. Can, I, can it really be that I'm saved? Bad as I am, horrible as I have been, um, hypocritical as I have been, can it, can it truly be proximity to conversion, negligence uh, or sin, negligence of the means of grace? Oh, the church is just full of hypocrites. I'm not going down there anymore. Now, those people, they, they're always judging me. So we, you know, we stop praying. We stop reading our Bibles. We quit going to church. We're not under the ministry of the word. In, in our church, you know, you can watch this progression from they're sitting in the middle downstairs, and then they move to the back downstairs. Then they move to the balcony. Then they move to the edge of the balcony. Next thing I know, we're going to another church. That has happened repeatedly, so I'm not judging people who are sitting in the balcony, but I am saying it's been, uh, been um, But if you used to sit downstairs, he is. <laughs> so it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting to watch over the years. So proximity to conversion, negligence or sin. Will sin rob you of your uh, assurance? It will. It will, especially when, it, when the sin becomes habitual. When it becomes habitual, characteristic, chronic, it will rob you of your assurance. It may, uh, we may be led to question everything, whether any of it's true. Rightly so, the, the scriptures say the fruit of of the flesh are, are all those sins and it's not the only reason that you might know that you're not saved. Yeah, the deeds of the flesh, yes. And, and then the third is the sovereign divine desertions. So the, the Puritans were really good at this and I found it to be extremely helpful. I read this book, The Genius of Puritanism, and it had a large section on, on um, the, this Puritan, I, I, um, and it's not just the Puritans, I'm, I'm Medieval theologians were rich in this as well. But they're, they're just their seasons where God seems to hide himself. And you do not sense his favor. You do not sense his blessing. The promise, promises seem not to be true. Um, you know, Isaiah, surely you are a God who hides himself. And Job is repeating that over and over. Where are you? Um, how long, you know, Psalm 13, how long? The howling psalm, uh, uh, Spurgeon called. How long? Will you forsake us? How long will this go on? You know, where are you? Um, is that experience of the people of God over the centuries? Absolutely it is. Does it mean they're lost? No. 
Does it mean they lack assurance? Yeah, for a season, perhaps. Uh, and, and yet it not being as a result of sin necessarily. Yes. Is it important or can I make a distinction between uh, the uh, experience of a sovereign divine desertion and the reality of a sovereign divine desertion? I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, he, I'm light of the world, he that believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I will never leave you and forsake you. And, and other, the like, scripture where the reality is one thing, but maybe the perception of the experience is something else. That's exactly the, the, the distinction that, that has to be made. Yes, the reality is unchanging. The perception... So even Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was, uh, was there a division between the second and first persons of the Trinity? No. So was he, was he, um, was he, um, was the Father absent? No, the Father's omnipresent. Um, was, he, was he denied any sense of the presence of God? Yes. Any sense of his favor, any sense of his presence? Uh, so he experienced forsakenness. So yeah, I think there's a difference. That, no, that's an important distinction between the experience and the reality. The reality is I will never leave nor forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, the reality is um, that we are safe in the Father's hands and that no one can pluck us from his hands or, the, or, or, or Christ's hands. But the perception can be um, God's not answering my prayers. I don't sense his presence. Um, you know, I, I can say about myself, or whatever it's worth, every morning I sense, I, I sense the presence of God. I do. When I do go and read my Bible and pray. I, I do. But I can't rely on that. I can't depend on it. I have to trust that it's true, that when I call upon him in prayer, that he hears me. And uh, that he promises to be with me. So we, we trust the reality of the promise rather than the perception of the experience. Uh, yeah. As a pastoral issue, <clears throat> when dealing with people who have struggled with this, have you seen it descend to levels where we're looking towards suicide? And I'm thinking of that hymn writer that, uh, I forget his name, but we Cooper, it's William yeah. Cooper. Cooper, that's it. C-O-W-P. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was he more Wesleyan influence? He wasn't. He was not. He was a Calvinist. He was, uh, and part of his, part of the time, he was a member of Newton, John Newton's church, and he contributed to the old, only hymns, O L N E Y, the hymn book that was produced by Newton and Cooper and uh, some others. But he was one of those personalities who who wrestled with uh, just depression. You know what what's behind that? I mean, we still don't. Do we still know why people get depressed? Sometimes it's physiological. You know. Sometimes it's spiritual, but, it, but he, he, plung, he would plunge into dark, dark places. Spurgeon talked about the black dog. Yeah, he would, I, I used to call it Black Monday. You know, I'd get done doing uh, pre, uh, preaching or when I was younger, <clears throat> still in seminary, uh, leading a Bible study, and I would go back and just plunge into despair because it didn't measure up, didn't get said what needed to be said, didn't say it well. Forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, but that, yeah, when some, yeah. I, th I think real Christians can go in very, very dark places. And I think they have to fight it. Uh, so this is really part of what this is saying. You have to fight that. If you are, you know, there's personality types. I think if you are inclined to go to dark places, you have to tell yourself that's where you're going and fight it and say, I'm not going there, and plead for help, and, uh, and plead for rescue, and know that about yourself. So I have to say that to, I've had to say that to some of my children. I said, look, I, I see this, I see the way your personality tends, you have to fight this off. Don't go there. Resist this, pray your way out of this. Do not give in to the despair. So. In, in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, when um, Christian and Hope are crossing the river to the celestial city, it's just a, it's just an awesome uh, picture of Hopeful trying to encourage Christian who, who feels he's sinking, he's not going to make it, he's going to drown, the waves are going over his head, and, 
and the things that Hopeful is saying to him, the true things that Hopeful is saying to him, um, it's just such a, I don't know, it's a great picture of, yeah. of one who has assurance and one who struggles with it. Yeah. So I found myself saying with people, some people close to me, um, um, do you know that your sins are forgiven? Well, I don't know. Do you believe in Jesus? Well, I do, but I'm not sure if my faith is real. Well, do you, do you love going to church? I do. Do you love uh, being under the ministry of the word? I do. Do you love the people of God? I do. Oh, sorry, that's just natural to you, huh? That, that just comes naturally to you. You're just naturally virtuous, and so you love <laughs> the scriptures, and you love God's people, and that's all something you've just been able to generate all on your own, and you want to obey him, and you want to please him, and you want to live a holy life, and uh, you want to manifest the How about what's the main thing you want for your children? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about that question? Yes. Yeah. The main thing you want for children is you want them to go to heaven. Yeah. Why? Because you believe the Bible, right? <laughs> you believe the gospel. Um, so you know, I think I think you do have to sometimes take people through steps, uh, through that. Your life is inexplicable apart from the reality of your faith in Christ, and that you believe He's the Savior, and you've repented and put your faith in Him, and you have surrender your soul over to him. It's, your life is utterly inexplicable. What do you mean you, you don't know whether or not you believe? Of course you believe. Of course you do. Um, so, all right. Where are we? So question number three then. What are the three types of law uh, mentioned in 19, 1 through 5, and what is the function of each. But uh, before we go to that, I want to give some introductory, just some introductory, you know, it's, in the, it's in the notes. Um, but some of the writers who, who've uh, you know, produced uh, these publications in recent years, really, really good uh, uh, studies on the, um, uh, the Westminster Assembly that have been published by Reformation Heritage Books, they have identified rightly that the, 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 the number one challenge facing the Westminster Assembly at the time was the antinomian challenge, more so even than Rome, and, and more so even than the Arminian challenge. Uh, so that uh, Tobias Crisp and John Saltmarsh were two of the leading voices of antinomianism who were, who were um, preaching a version of, of cheap grace, uh, faith without repentance, faith without the fruit of works, just bare faith basically as assent is all that is necessary for salvation without the necessity of obedience and anything else flowing from that faith. Um, and so th this, uh, this, uh, this chapter on the law of God is at least in part um, and to a significant degree, it's aimed at the antinomians, the people that deny there's any role for the law of God among the people of God. So among the places that we go to establish the normativity of the law for the people of God would be the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Abolish is exactly what the antinomians are saying. And yet, it's, that's directly what Jesus says he hasn't come to do. So whatever I understand about fulfill, it cannot mean abolish. And what he does, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount is then he gives his exposition of the law. Now, do you, know, do you, know, um, you have heard that the, uh, the prophets have said you shall not uh, murder, but I say to you, if you hate your brother, and you've heard the, you know, that uh, the prophets have said you you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you, look, if you look so as to lust, in other words, Jesus is giving his exposition, and as he does so, he doesn't ab uh, abrogate the law, he deepens its application, he expands its application, so that it's not just external behavior, it's internal heart attitude, and that's what he meant when he said that your righteousness must, uh, must exceed that of the of the scribes and the Pharisees. You must have a righteousness that exceeds theirs because theirs had become something only of external conformity. Yeah, I've not murdered anyone. Yes, I've not committed adultery. Uh, so that means that I have fulfilled the keeping of the law. And Jesus is saying, no, you're reading the law superficially. It goes much deeper than that. Uh, so Jesus is, and Jesus is saying, this, as far as the 
timeline, the longevity of the law, it's normative until heaven and earth pass away. And, and, and down to the details, an iota or a dot, iota is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And then he, then he, 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 um, he condemns those who would relax one of the least of these commandments while saying, you know, it's not all that strict, don't worry about, uh, about, about that, and teaches others will be least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them, this is what he anticipates for his disciples. So that rank in the kingdom, they shall be called great, uh, is, is based on the keeping and teaching of the commandments. And then, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So that, that, that's about as strong a statement on the normativity of the moral law as you could hope to find. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. Uh, Romans 3, 31, do we then overthrow the law by faith? No, by no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Or in some of the translations, we establish the law. We put it in its right perspective, its right function, its right role, which is not as a, as a means of justification, but as a rule of life. So this is the common language amongst the Reformed, rule of life. Romans 8, 4, it uh, says that we walk, by the we walk by the Spirit in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So the righteous requirement of the law is to be fulfilled how? In those who walk. It's, it's in our behavior. Walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. The walking according to the Spirit results in the fulfillment of the righteous requirement of the law. Uh, Romans 13, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Any other commandment is uh, are, uh, summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So those who want to pit law against love and say, well, you know, you, you, we're not governed by law, we just do what the loving thing is rather than consulting the rule book, as, as it were. But it is the law that tells us Exactly. What defines love? You, where, where, where's the dictionary for that? Well, the law fills that out for us. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery against your neighbor, and you're not going to kill your neighbor, and you're not going to steal from your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against your neighbor, you're not going to covet what your neighbor has. It defines law. You know, you know, we don't go to Hollywood to figure out what love means. We, we don't go to the world to find that out. We go to the Bible to find out what love means, and love is defined by the, the stipulations of the law. So he, here the Spirit is leading us. So somebody wants to say, well, I just do what the Spirit leads. Okay, well, according to the Apostle Paul, where the Spirit leads is into conformity with, uh, with the commandments of God. Uh, love, love conforms to the law. The law, law is being required by love. And again, from James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only. So I think this, this is a, hopefully a helpful graph. It's in your notes. But as for understanding what the Bible is all about, so you can reduce it down to one command, love. Love God, love your neighbor. Ten commandments, one through four, have to do with loving God. Fifth kind of can go both ways. Loving your neighbor, six through ten, or five through ten. These are... The one commandment becomes two commandments, becomes ten commandments, which then the whole Bible is about this, in terms of the positive obligations of the people of God, it's all about love. All right, so what was that question? Oh, we didn't do a question. Question number three. Um, all right, so let's, let's read some of these paragraphs. Let's at least get started with this. God gave to Adam a law, the, a law as a covenant of works. We've seen this in previous chapters. Um, by which he bound him in his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling, and threatened death upon the breach of it, and in, endued him with power and ability to keep it. So the covenant of works, which we saw earlier, is the foundation, is built on law. He is to fulfill the law. What law? Well, the moral law. This law 
after his fall, continued to be the perfect rule of righteousness, the same law to have Adam in the garden, and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments, and written in two tables, the first four commandments containing our duty towards God, and the other six our duty to man. Love God, love your neighbor. Besides this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church underage ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. To them also, paragraph four, was a body politic or civil laws he gave sundry judicial laws, which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging uh, any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. All right, so to stop there, question number three is uh, asking the question, what are the three types of law mentioned in 19, 1 through 5. So we can, we, can, we, can, we can answer that at this point through the, the first four. Uh, there's the ceremonial law that's fulfilled in Christ. And it consists of such items as the various cleansing ordinances, uh, the sacrificial system, the calendar of holy days, circumcision, the dietary laws, the temple, the priesthood, the laws of separation. Those are all ceremonial, and they have been abrogated. So uh, I should not be attempting to reintroduce these things, and that would be our basic critique of what's going on in the high church denominations, whether Rome or Canterbury or Antioch. They are reintroducing these things. So if you go to a traditional Roman Catholic church, you've got lavers for cleansing. You have an altar. Uh, where the sacrifice of the Mass is, is being offered. You have a calendar of holy days. Practically every day of the year corresponds to something. Um, circumcision, no. Uh, dietary laws, well, traditional Roman Catholic, right? Friday, fish day, right? You fast from meat. Temple, uh, yes. Uh, their buildings are temples. They are sacred spaces. Uh, priesthood, absolutely. Uh, laws of separation, not so much. Well, except for the monastic orders. And the priests can't marry. Okay. Okay, good point. Laws of those. Priestly celibacy. Yeah, it goes beyond the Old Testament. Because the priest married in the Old Testament. So then, then it, the, the next paragraph, paragraph four, speaks of the civil law limited to Israel as a political entity. <coughs> civil penalties national polity. So the answer to the question, why don't we stone adulterers and homosexuals anymore? Uh, the reason is those were civil penalties <coughs> that were implemented in Israel as a national polity. And the, the, the people of God are no longer organized as a nation. There was a particular severity to those civil penalties that were not meant to be reproduced uh, universally throughout all the nations on earth. Okay, they were designed for a particular people, a particular place, a particular time. They were, like the ceremonial law, the civil laws were, by nature, temporary, for the temporary arrangement of the people of God as a nation state. So they had a political, they had a polity, you know, a political organization, a monarchy, and they had a, a, um, judicial laws, and uh, they had civil penalties for the violation of those laws. Those are part of the civil order which were temporary for that temporary arrangement of the people of God as a nation. Now we are organized as an international community, as a church, so we don't have a civil law. And the civil law that was designed for Israel uh, uh, no longer ha is, uh, has a, a application because there is no longer that national entity, except the confession does say any uh, further than the general equity 
thereof may acquire. General equity, principles of justice that we may derive from the principles of justice in uh, the laws of Israel as they applied to citizens of Israel and, and to the nation. Um, so I've, I've natural law, you know, is, is there that which we can draw from the nat natural law to uh, in, in understanding what to, were the principles of gen general principles of equity in Israel? Well, it's, it's opening the door for that to be that to be a reasonable thing for one to do. Okay, the paragraph five, the moral law doth forever bind all as well justified persons as others to the obedience thereof, and that not only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God, the creator who gave it, neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthen this obligation. So that last, um, that last then is the moral. Here's the threefold division then. We have the ceremonial, the civil, and the moral, which is perpetually binding. And it will then be divided, the, the, the moral law will then be divided into three categories of use. And this is where it does get confusing, and I, I admit. Because you have the three categories of law, but then you have the three uses of the, civil, of the moral law. And there is a civil use of the moral law and the pedagogic use, and then the normative use. So we will come back to that after we take a five-minute break. Mm -hmm.